everybody. Uh, b before I start, I wanted to ask you, who of you uh, worked on a project that was one year old? Okay. Keep your hand up if you, it was two years old, three years, four, five. Whoa. Okay. We have some people, thanks, uh, who worked on old projects. That's nice. Hopefully you didn't have many reasons to complain and after this talk you'll be able to make them even better. Okay, so uh, my name is Pavel Leftak. I work, work at GOG.com. If you would like to ask more about the company, what cool stuff we do, we can talk after, after this talk. Uh, I'll be happy to help. And you can find me on Twitter where slides will be uh, published later. And before we start, uh, I, I should explain what do I mean by long-term projects. But uh, that excludes anything that is basic uh, landing page, a promo page, something that would be killed in a few months. That's not long-term project. Long-term project for me is something that lives for half a year, for a year, two years. You work on it on and on because, for example, it's a product that your company develops and sells to other customers. And we're interested in keeping that project in a good health, good shape. So, uh, we are happy working with that, right? So, uh, if you have a chance to, uh, apply all the advice I, I will give you, uh, it will work for a new project, for a greenfield project. But if you are working currently on a project that could be called legacy or or something in between, still some of the things could be applied, could be used uh, for your benefit. So in, in the beginning, for every project uh, that we work on, the, always the first step should be analysis. And it doesn't matter whether you write a big specification, a big document uh, specifying all the requirements or not, um, it could be just one page, but Whatever uh, your approach is, most of us, most of you ask the wrong question. The question is what to build. When you talk with a customer that wants some software, uh, you are thinking what kind of software should I build? Should it be a CMS, CRM, uh, some blog application, financial stuff and so, and so on? And Honestly, that's the biggest mistake you can do for the project you are working on. You shouldn't ask what to build. You shouldn't be asking about the software. You should be asking about the problem. What problem my software will be solving? How can I help you as a developer to develop something that could uh, imp improve your daily work? And that's what we as developers should focus on. We shouldn't care at the beginning that it's a CMS. No, we need to uh, figure out what's the actual problem. What's, uh, how, how does the daily work of customers look like right now? And how can we automate it? How can we improve it? Uh, Marius Gill, who is a developer quite common, quite uh, well known in Poland said that it's root of all uh, evil in programming that you write first code before talking to to right people and asking right questions before, because bef uh, without asking right questions to the right people and those people being the customers mostly you won't be able to build something that solves the problem um, right you might uh, finish a project you might deploy it it will work without any issues but it could be it is a possibility that it won't be what customer wanted, right? So we need to ask that question in the beginning. And it's also quite common that what ends up in production is not what customer wanted, but what developer understood. So if there's like tension on the, between a customer, between a business client and uh, developers and the company that will develop the software, uh, there's a there, there's a lot of place for misunderstandings. Uh, let's say business people are trying to explain something, then 
th there could be some kind of analyst or project manager that uh, is trying to understand it. And then he or she translates that into a different language for developers. And right now we have two different dictionaries to call same things. And that's also a problem because we shouldn't uh, use uh, different terms for same things, right? So when you talk with uh, with customer or some new feature, you shouldn't be talking about tables, databases, rows, JavaScript, etc. You should be using business terms because with that approach, there's no way to uh, add any misunderstanding. You're using same words for same things, so it makes things easier. And it could be sometimes the case that you don't know some meaning of some words, right? If you have limited dictionary, you won't be able to fully understand everything. And if you try to use your language, technical language on for business terms, um, that's a bad thing. And one of uh, one approach to, to, to mitigate that is to use domain driven design. Uh, well, it's a really big, big topic that I won't dive into, but one of the uh, benefits of using DDD approach is that DDD forces you to use uh, common language. So both customer or business client and you need to use same words to uh, explain things. And DDD is very commonly used along with event storming. And again, event storming is a big, big concept that, uh, to keep it short, uh, is kind of workshop where you try to squeeze out as much knowledge from a uh, customer as possible. So you ask about workflows, you ask about events, what should be reaction to different events, uh, about some different edge cases and so on and so on. And you need to use same language to figure out as much as possible about the current business that uh, your customer has. And then you will not know what issues they're facing, what kind of problems they have. And only then you can start thinking about the code. And even if you think that you have all figured out, there's always going to be change, especially if it's a long-term project. If, if you start in January, you can be sure that by June, July, some uh, requirements may change, uh, some may be already obsolete and new ones may appear. Okay, so you have your uh, analysis done, you know what's the problem, you know uh, how it works right now, and you have some idea how to improve it. So it's time, time to write first uh, line of code, right? And before you do that, you, you should uh, ask yourself what type of architecture should I use? If it's going to be a, <coughs> sorry, a big uh, project, a cho choice of bad ar architecture at the start can slow you down in the long run. And these days, quite common question is, should I use monolith or should I use microservice? And uh, every conference, even this, this had to talk about microservices. And well, to keep it short, I will say what uh, Martin Fuller said, you shouldn't start with microservices. If you don't have any experience with them, uh, if you just think it's cool, it's hype, you want to use it because it's new, it's fresh, uh, and your project is quite boring and it could use some new exciting stuff, don't do it. Please don't do it. Do it in your side project, uh, experiment with it, with it, play with it, see what are the benefits, uh, what's the good thing about microservices. Don't believe people talking at conferences and saying that microservice is a uh, uh, silver bullet for every problem. It's not. If you know what kind of uh, mm, overhead is uh, connected to microservices and you know all the benefits and the drawbacks, then yeah, do it. But otherwise, it's a thing called uh, cargo, cargo cult. It looks like this. It's a kind of belief that you can replicate something more advanced and it will work for you as well, easily. Uh, 
it was developed around 40s, 40s, 50s, uh, in 20th century, where uh, some tribes in New Zealand were discovered and uh, people were sending planes with supplies, with cargo. And they thought, hey, if we build a plane, it will, it will give us this food, this medicines and stuff, right? No, it will not. And because Netflix is using microservices, it doesn't mean it, it's useful for you as well. But we'll get back to that. So what I would uh, suggest it in terms of architecture, it, you, sh you should use service-oriented ori architecture. It's old, it's tested, uh, well, it was verified many, many times. Maybe it's not exciting, but it uh, keeps your code clean. Uh, also, the thing that Uncle Bob uh, recommended a long time ago, clean art architecture, probably have seen this image many times. It, again, it might be boring, it might be old, but it works. And if you uh, try to follow it, the idea behind uh, clean architecture is that you separate your code into layers. In the center, you have uh, entities like business rules, business logic, that is separated from everything else. Your classes that uh, reflect business rules have no idea that there's some kind of database and even what is it. It has no idea about framework you are using, whether it's going to be used for web, for command line, or a network interface, or whatever else. On top of that, you have use cases with like uh, application uh, business rules, and then you have your framework, your controllers, databases, and each <coughs> so it should be should be even more uh, separated. And the only way uh, of communication should be from outside to the inside. So your uh, framework, your controllers, models can communicate with business models, but not the way other way around. Your business model shouldn't have any clue about what's in the, on the outside. And that way, it's much easier to keep it separated, to keep it well tested, and to reuse it if you need it. Um, when it comes to architecture, I think it's best not to try reinventing the wheel. Uh, I've, I've met a company uh, where they tried to reinvent literally everything, like handling HTTP requests, handling database connection, JSON, XML parsing, and so on. It's a waste of time. There's a lot of ready-to-use frameworks. There's a lot of libraries you can use. and. <clears throat> Uh, I bet that you don't have so much time uh, to create a library uh, of similar quality as open source libraries. So you should use that. And even if you think that you should create your own, don't do it. Your use case is probably not unique. Uh, many people did similar stuff before. All of us used, uh, I don't know, some kind of web framework handled HTTP requests connected to database and so on. And your use case isn't unique enough to justify writing something like that from scratch. Focus on business logic. That's what makes your project unique. Yeah, and we're back to hype. All those keywords look cool. I bet there was, uh, there was, there were a few talks about those things like machine learning, serverless microservices. And it looks cool. You might be interested into applying some of these in projects because it's new, because it's shiny, and developers like shiny stuff, right? Who doesn't? Especially if you work in a long-term project that gets boring over time. But again, if you don't understand all the benefits and all the drawbacks of some solution, you shouldn't use it. If some new technology won't give you big advantage over competitors, you shouldn't use it as well, right? Uh, last last year, two years, th there was a lot of companies that claimed that they made a public announcement that we're going to use blockchain. And suddenly everybody said, whoa, it's, it's going to be a great company using blockchain. Well, if you don't understand really how blockchain works and what's its purpose, it's a waste of time, really, unless it matches your use case perfectly. 
Um, so I would like to focus on things that work, that make your project better, uh, that uh, keep it uh, two steps ahead of competition. If using, let's say, if you want to switch to microservices from Monolith, it could take you months to migrate, and in the end, you lost a few months of regular development, adding new features because you did the migration or uh, rewrite to a different language. You should always think twice before doing something like that. Okay, so we did analysis, we did uh, choose our act architecture, and we are already writing some code, right? And before you write code, you should write tests. I know that maybe it's not a common uh, approach. Who of you is using TDD here on a daily basis? Okay, nice. That's cool. Um, so I would like more people to use TDD. And not because it's, uh, it's about tests. T well, for me, tests are kind of side effect from test-driven development or test-driven design. Uh, for me, result of TDD is well uh, written code. Code that is easy to reuse, easy to test, easy to refactor. Uh, and tests are just the side effect that makes sure your, your code is written uh, uh, in a way that just works, right? And the most common complaint about TDD that I heard is that, well, yeah, it's nice, but for me, it doesn't really work. Uh, it's hard to write a test with my code. And Kent Beck, who wrote uh, TDD by example book, said that uh, it's not a problem with tests, it's a problem with your code. If your code is hard to test, it's code problem, right? So if you start with writing tests from the beginning, it will at least try to keep your code uh, in good shape, in good quality. So once you have your code and tests written, uh, it's time for code review. And I don't want to go into what co code review is and how to do it. Uh, there are other talks about that. But I want to focus on one thing that isn't mentioned quite often, and that is uh, learning opportunity. Code reviews aren't only about finding bugs, about finding issues in the code, uh, but it should be also opportunity for new team members to learn about the project. It should be opportunity for everybody to ask questions. So if you next time you don't understand something in a code review, ask about it. Uh, ask for explanation, discuss the code, if you're not sure, that's the place to raise your uh, mm, concerns and comment on that. If you don't feel confident about the code being merged, uh, say it loudly, talk with your peers, and that way you will know your code much better. Okay, so you have your code uh, tested, discussed, it's in the repository already. So next step, for, for our project would be continuous integration. And by continuous integration, I mean all the automatic stuff that happens after you merge your code. So your code is uh, <coughs> sorry, formatted, obviously using black. Uh, it's tested. Uh, you maybe run some automatic checks on code quality. You might gather some metrics about code coverage, about uh, usage of the pocket methods, etc. Cetera, et cetera. That, that's really a lot of things you could do for continuous, continuous integration step. And it's really useful if you have a long-term project. And well, next obvious thing related to continuous integration is continuous deployment. Uh, the basic idea behind continuous deployment is that once you merge your change, it's being tested, it's being integrated into repository, and it's being deployed automatically on production and staging and testing some others, uh, other environments along the way. And you might say, hey, I don't want to deploy my code right away after it's merged, right? But there's one confusion, common confusion about that. And I want to 
uh, said loudly that deployment is not the same thing as release. You could use uh, things like uh, toggles, feature toggles, to enable and disable things on production. So you could deploy your code on production, but let's say a new feature wouldn't be active yet unless you turn it on. So that way, uh, continuous deployment could be a thing for you. And you could easily release new features whenever you want because your code is already there. It's already in production. You can turn it off, on. Uh, you can use toggles for canary re releases, canary re testing as well. And one really big uh, bonus of continuous integration and continuous testing is that you can feel like a boss. You can do deploys on Fridays. I know that sounds scary, but believe me, if you have your code uh, in good shape, well tested, and you do deploys continuously every day, multiple times a day, why wouldn't you do it on Friday? Well, I know for legacy project that's not tested and so on. Yeah, let's not do it. But for new project, I hope you will do it. That powerful thing it gives you is addictive, really. Okay, so you have your project in production already. Cool. And next thing you need is monitoring and logging. You need some centralized logging uh, system to be able to check what's the state of the application, what are the issues, errors, and so on. And by monitoring, I mean mostly IT-related stuff like uh, health checks, server load, uh, network traffic, number of requests, uh, memory usage, CPU load, and, and so on and so on. Everything related to machines, uh, to, to, to your code as well, but mostly technical. And the next thing uh, that may be similar but is not are metrics. And metrics are more uh, closely related to business stuff of, of your application. So it could be number of uh, new customers, number of purchases, volume of transactions, uh, and so on and so on. And also you could combine both, like have uh, metrics and monitoring, and you could monitor some metrics. So for example, if number of payments drops below some threshold, you, you should have an alert in the middle of the night because something is clearly wrong, right? Um, yeah. and. Another thing uh, you should have, and you shouldn't wait until it's on production, is automation. You should automate all the things possible, really. If it moves, automate it. Uh, idea behind that is if you need to do something once, it's okay. If you need to do something twice, well, you should consider maybe writing a script for that. But if you have to do something three times, and you do it manually, it needs to be automated. There's really no other way around it. Because if you do stuff manually, th there's a big chance you write the typo. And typo when removing a directory could be deadly, uh, or deleting a table, or something else. And if, if something is automated, everybody uh, can see the code, find issues, uh, everybody can do it. If some action requires, let's say, a click in a continuous in integration system. And if you don't automate things, a new manager will be hired because you're not effective enough. So you are. Um, yeah, so you have your code checked, tested, reviewed, on production, you deploy on Fridays, Friday, 5 p.m. Yeah, it works. But do you have documentation? I, I bet that most of you don't like to write documentation because it's not cool, it's boring, time consuming, and at the time of writing, you don't really see the benefit. Um, and writing, st starting to write the documentation for an existing project is a really, really big, uh, another project, really. And the best thing to do is to start with readme file. Just one file, nothing really big or, or fancy. And try to des describe things in a readme. 
And this is a, a structure that uh, Ola Sandeska described in a blog post a year ago, I think. <coughs> How a good readme file should look like, right? So first you have a application name or a library name, point of contact, and that should be people responsible for the project who you should contact if you want to learn more. Usage, for example, how to use it on local machine or your, in your uh, development environment. System are all kind of uh, requirements like database, HTTP server, uh, caching, etc. that is being used by this application. So you can find all the information in one file. Runbook is set of uh, instructions what to do is if something breaks on production. So, for example, if payments doesn't work, do this, check that, and do something else, right? So you don't have to figure out quickly how the app works, you have it described in one place. And la last two things are just links to some monitoring system where you can check the uh, state, current state of the application and link to full-blown documentation that you'll probably uh, write later on. And I said that you don't uh, consider writing documentation a fulfilling task, but it, it really is in the future. It's like a love letter to yourself. Imagine writing uh, any kind of project really today and that you have to go back to it in a six months. You probably won't remember much from the how it was implemented, how does it work, etc. And if you write even a basic readme file, you'll be grateful to yourself from the past that you did it. It's, it saves a lot of time, believe me. And even if you have all those things, even if you have um, good CI and CD pipelines, you have great documentation, there's one piece missing. And that piece is communication. And if you uh, will just remember one thing from this talk, I want you uh, to remember that communication is not a soft skill. That people say, oh, I'm good at programming, but soft communication, talking, it's, it's not my stuff. I, I'm not good at it. But communication is a core skill. You need it because b without communication, everything else will fail. You won't be able to talk properly with customer. You won't be able to ask good questions. Uh, instead of being a team member, you will work in a silo, uh, cut off from other people working alone. Uh, yeah, so communication is really the essential thing for every long-term project. And uh, it happened to me that I worked with people who tried to gather all the knowledge from, for, from, for uh, themselves. They wouldn't share it. And they looked like they're more uh, productive because they could do stuff that other, other people couldn't do. And the thing is that they were just, they had just uh, poor communication skills, right? Um, I once worked with, uh, with that, the manager that said, uh, if somebody isn't, is irrepressible, uh, sorry, uh, if, if it's hard to replace a person in a team, it means uh, that that person doesn't share knowledge and that person should be the first one to be fired. Because you don't want that kind of people in your team. I know it sounds harsh, uh, but really it could be improved with a little bit better communication, really. And I found this quote that I really liked. Um, I work in IT right now for 10 years. And after that long time, you could easily switch languages because you have all the knowledge already and uh, trying to dive in into new technology like Java, for example, C Sharp and others, it's much easier after so, so long time. And you, you cannot really improve much further if it comes to your skills because all the uh, hype or the keywords I, I mentioned earlier is not really a new, new stuff. Like uh, one of the others could be functional programming. Right, that it's getting more popular these days. And it's not really a really new thing. 
it was invented a long time ago and people are reinventing same stuff over and over. So one place you can, where you can grow as a developer uh, is be better at communication. And that's all I wanted to share with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Pavel. Uh, yeah, we have quite some questions. Uh, first thing would be, where did you learn all this? Well, experience with a lot of failed projects, really. <laughs> and by failed, I don't mean a project that uh, was a disaster, but um, imagine that you are missing, for example, tests. You can successfully work on a project without tests, but it means that you will develop new features more slowly. Uh, you can work on a project without documentation, but without understanding how existing code works, it takes you much more, much longer to develop new features. And if you don't have uh, all the things I mentioned, well, maybe that could lead to a disaster. Thanks. Uh, well, um, first question from the audience. Uh, how do you translate a technical term that doesn't uh, have a business terminology equivalent? Uh, so mm -hmm. that was from, from the beginning of your uh, presentation. Um, no. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I don't tr translate it at all. I mean, business people are not interested into technical terms. So let's take uh, secure S, right? like another hype, another sexy password. But business doesn't really care about how it's implemented. They are interested only if it uh, solves their problem. Right? So that would be my answer. Now, there are some, uh, when you go to an interview in some companies, they will ask you, how would you explain email server to your grandmom, yeah? So in case you are not able to explain stuff in your... Then I'm asking, is that something I will have to do every day? If you are talking to your um, stakeholder, perhaps. Well, <laughs> well, it depends on the position, maybe. Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, well, uh, next question would be, were there cases uh, when you did have to reinvent the wheel? Yeah, so you explained... Yeah, you don't mm -hmm. have. You shouldn't do it. But was when was it necessary? Do you remember? Mm -hmm. uh, no, not really. I can remember one project when where uh, architect decided that we need a custom framework in that project. So he used his own custom framework that he worked <laughs> on after hours. Uh, the project was used, I mean, the framework was used for a few months, uh, and then he left. <laughs> <laughs> and people have to, had to deal with some legacy project that wasn't maintained any, anymore. And that's really scary how big waste of time it is, because you have to learn this new library or new framework. You have to work work with its limitations because it's not perfect, full featured. And then, if you change jobs, you're not able to reuse it probably, right? Because it was proprietary, and yeah, so it's a really big waste of time to do that. So I didn't have a case like that where it was useful. So what happened to that project in the end? So did you manage to uh, change it, or it just failed uh, spectacularly? Um, I didn't work at that, for that project uh, directly. I just observed it uh, from these sidelines. Uh, so I'm not sure really what happened in the end because I also changed that. Good choice. Uh, what are some non-obvious signs that some parts of your projects are not future-proof? Mm -hmm. Um... Okay, so let me answer that with a story. Um, how is it called? Um, there's a thing called code retreat. It's like a kind of workshop when you work on a project. Uh, and 
I was on, on such a workshop once, and the idea behind that was to make your code as generic as possible. And we worked for an hour or two, implemented some basic stuff, and then after two hours, somebody, the, the guy who ran the workshop said, okay, we're going to change some um, requirements from the beginning. Right? You, you, it, was, um, it was Game of Life. Do you know Game of Life? Yeah, okay, some of you do. So there's a rule that says if a cell has three neighbors, it's going to stay alive or something like that. I can remember to you right now. And it was a really simple change. Like it said, instead of having three neighbors, I need to have exactly one neighbor to keep to stay alive, right? Sounds simple, but if your code is not generic enough, then such a change in requirements will be really time consuming for you to implement. And th there was this one guy who was uh, brilliant, really, because he his code was ready for requirements such as changing from two dimensions to three dimensions, and then n dimensions. <laughs> it wasn't really a requirement. Uh, the task description didn't say it, it is two-dimensional field. We all assumed that, except for him. And his code was uh, resistant to those changes. Thanks. Uh, so, some more. Uh, when is starting a project with a large team from the day one justified? Like a big team, like 100 people or so? Hmm. Well, that's one really hard for me to answer because I didn't work in such big, uh, big teams. Even if um, our projects that we work on at the GOG are big, because we have around 20, 20 developers working on that, uh, it, we are divided into smaller teams. Because we are using Scrum, it doesn't make much sense uh, to have more than five, six people on the team. So we are divided into smaller contexts. Uh, each team is responsible for some parts of the application. And I can imagine having 100 pe people working on a single project, really. Uh, we have some more questions, but not with this. this. Uh, any rules for evolving features like API versioning, deprecation warnings, especially when a big project consists of smaller independent teams? Mm -hmm. Well, for, I didn't have a case like that, but I really like uh, what uh, Google is apparently doing, and they, I, they are having single repository for all the code. So where you, your code change breaks something, you need to fix it in all the other projects. <laughs> so you need to be very wary of uh, what, what, what kind of change you want to introduce. Mm -hmm. uh, how how this all stack with the uh, lean or agile uh, methodologies? Uh, I know you explain step mm -hmm. after step, but this is not entirely like you have to do this once. Yeah, so it's probably yeah. So well, uh, agile is really n nice in a way that uh, you're not forced to implement something in a let's say few months, but you you can use iterative approach, I implement simplest solution possible, talk with customers, see if it is what they had in mind. If it is, continue that path. If it isn't, you can change approach, write something differently. Uh, I have one more question. Uh, any books that you can recommend? Um, okay, so I mentioned uh, Kent Beck. He wrote uh, TDD by example, and it's a really great book if you want to start writing tests. Uh, it explains how to do it step by step on really simple example. It's written in Java, but it's easy to, to understand and figure out how to do it in other projects, other languages. Okay, thanks. Uh, and probably a last one because, yeah. Uh, how would you approach a legacy project that has poor documentation and a few tests? Mm -hmm when you need to add new features? Uh, 
Mm. And you don't, cannot throw it away and start from the beginning. Yeah, yeah. But, well, most, most, most people hate legacy projects, but the reason they are around is that they bring money. So mm. you cannot throw it away, really, never. Uh, so in that case, um, I would try to find some time to write some tests to, for, for the feature I want to add or change or modify. I need to make sure it worked before and it works after my changes. Uh, what if the writing of the test is so difficult that it's, uh, okay. where to start? Yeah, it could, it could be that tests are hard to write because code is messy. So in that case, mm -hmm. uh, I would start with some uh, BDD tests, like behavioral yeah. testing. So big, or, big picture. Yeah, yeah. To testing something on big picture. And then once I, I'm sure that it works before and after, then I can dig into uh, classes and try to refactor it. Because having the big picture acceptance test, uh, I'm still sure that it works after my changes. Yeah, thanks. I hope this was not more of an interrogation. And <laughs> I uh, I hope that you enjoyed it and you enjoyed it as well. So thank Pavel. Thank you.